Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Tracy. I'm an event marketing manager here with Henry Schein. Uh, we're glad to have you tonight and I'm gonna be your moderator. So if at any point during the webinar you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel and we will cover them at the end. To ensure a smooth viewing experience, make sure that your volume is up and any large applications on your computer or mobile device are closed. This webinar is being presented by Henry Schein Dental and no fee credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Maureen Perry. Dr. Perry is a professor and director of the Center for Advanced Oral Health at A.T. Still University, Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health. She is a fellow of the former Academy of Dentistry for Persons with Disabilities, currently the SCDA Council of Dentistry for People with Disabilities, and is also a diplomate of the American Board of Special Care Dentistry. Dr. Perry has a 25 year career, both practicing and teaching special care dentistry with a particular interest in working with patients with developmental disabilities and has conducted and published an abundance of research in the field. Dr. Perry, thanks so much for being with us today. And with that said, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Tracy. And uh, good evening to everybody and good afternoon if you're on the West Coast like I am. And um, let's, uh, let's get started. There's a lot of information to cover and uh, I wanna make sure that we uh, have an opportunity for some questions at the end. Okay, Tracy, I'm just gonna confirm with you that my slide share is up and you can see the slides correctly. Yes, looks great. Perfect, thank you. So our learning objectives tonight are to uh, be able to list the main types of developmental disabilities, uh, describe what is meant by modifying or adapting treatment plans for people with developmental disabilities, and then to be able to apply these principles to our clinical practice. Uh, dental care is the most prevalent unmet health care need for all children with special needs, and that's even more true for uh, adults with special needs. So, you know, pediatric dentists are often trained to, they're trained to, um, work uh, around the behaviors and with children with different kinds of behaviors and with special needs. And, um, you know, the rest of us don't have as much training um, if we're general dentists. So there are some barriers and so there are certainly financial barriers since most people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are covered under Medicaid, um, under the um, EPSDT, the early prevention, uh, let's see, EPS, screening, um, testing, and um, diagnosis um, <clears throat> statute. And, you know, there's lots of behavioral issues. So sometimes people have different kinds of behaviors and that can be difficult, especially um, in, a, in a private practice that can be kind of difficult. Um, and, you know, when we opened um, the Center for Advanced Oral Health, one of the issues we had was our, some of our faculty um, that work across the hall in, in our um, orthodontic clinic, were very concerned about our people with uh, special health care needs and said, wait, well, what if they're doing their thing or they're, they're spinning around or they're yelling or they're running around the waiting room and, and what if they look different? And then, you know, what about our patients? And I said, what a wonderful opportunity for parents to talk to their kids who are getting ortho treatment about how there are all different kinds of people in the world. What a great opportunity to have that talk about people with special needs. And uh, no one's ever complained about it and I don't expect anyone ever will. Um, also, dentists have not received education or clinical training in providing care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It only became a, a CODA standard for dental schools to have to teach um, this subject matter in um, 2006. Um, and all it said was assess. So, that means that dental schools could show videos and talk about it and that was good enough. Um, so if you graduated before 2006, you didn't get anything. If you graduated between 2006 and this year, you got maybe a little bit. Um, now the, the standard actually says uh, that you must um, manage a person with intellectual disabilities and manage really means to CODA, means recognize and refer. So we still are not, um, training people to actually treat patients. And as we all know, dentistry is super experiential. None of us are gonna do anything we've never done um, just because we took a CE or we read about it. So um, until it gets to treat, you know, I don't know that everyone will feel comfortable working with this population. 
So let's talk about the big picture. So developmental disability is the large umbrella term. And there are many developmental disabilities, but the big four and the ones we're gonna talk about tonight are intellectual disability, uh, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and autism. So these are the big ones. So big scoping umbrella, developmental disability, we call it DD. And then we have ID, CP, epilepsy, and autism. And why do you need to know about this? Well, these are the latest statistics and I will tell you, I got these yesterday, so I know they're the latest. Uh, about 17% of children in the United States have a developmental disabilities. And that can be anything such as a speech or language impairment, um, something as simple as stuttering, stuttering or stammering, um, uh, or things like to uh, serious developmental disabilities such as ID or CP or autism. And so that's one in six children. So there are a lot of people with developmental disabilities. And the numbers are increasing. Um, so in 2009 to 2011, and these are CDC statistics, uh, there were 16.2% of the population and children aged three to 17 years. And now uh, in 2017, it, it grew to 17.8. So there are more and more people with developmental disabilities. There's more and more children, which is really what the CDC tracks. Um, and there are several projects that there, if you're very interested in it, you can go onto the CDC website. Uh, you can't, it's not just for COVID data. There's lots of, they track everything. Uh, so you can find all about developmental disabilities. There's lots of information there and there's lots of statistics. Um, and don't forget these kids are all gonna grow up and then who is going to treat them? Um, when we look at the population of people with intellectual disability, we find that about 85% um, are kind of mild. They're like sixth graders. Um, and they are people who can develop good relationships and they can develop social and communication skills um, as small children and they can have vocational skills. They can maybe even um, be self-supportive. So um, I think we can all agree that we as practitioners, we can treat a sixth grader, right? You can reason with a sixth grader, you can talk with them, they understand dangers, they understand, uh, they can rationalize. Um, and so about 85% of people are pretty easy to deal with. Then we move down into people who are more moderate and that's about 10% of the people. And they're people who can, uh, can speak and, and acquire language and they can do some ADLs and that means activities of daily living. So they can bathe themselves and dress themselves, things like that. Um, but they might not be able to live on their own and they may have some difficulty with social convention. They may not really understand or be able to self-manage. Um, and then we have the severe folks and they may be able to speak or they may not, they may do alphabet and simple counting. Um, and, and these are folks who uh, the, the bottom two groups are really the ones who end up in a center uh, like the place that I work at in, in, um, in Arizona because these are folks who um, may have behavioral issues and are kind of difficult. But again, 85% of people are out and about living with their families or living in um, you know, uh, adult group homes and, or, uh, and can certainly uh, be seen by a general dentist. So let's talk about, when we talk about intellect, um, so we don't really use this so much anymore in the world of IDDD. We don't really use uh, IQ, um, but if you think about IQ, for those of you who've seen the wonderful movie, Forrest Gump, uh, Forrest has, a, has an IQ of, of around 70 to 75. And um, so it, it can be an indicate, in, in, um, a limitation in intellectual function. The average person has an IQ of around 100. The average dental um, student and therefore the average dentist has an IQ around 110. So you can see the level of intellectual functioning. And I just think of Forrest Gump when I, when I read this slide. Um, but we really now um, uh, really um, we're categorizing people more based on their conceptual skills. Can they speak? Do they understand bigger concepts like money and time? Um, can they, how are their interpersonal skills? Can they act, you know, interact with different types of people? Um, and can they, do they have practical skills? Can they text? Can they use a computer? Can they take care of themselves? Um, so what are the causes of intellectual disability? Well, and these are in the order on which uh, they, uh, they're caused in America. So fetal alcohol syndrome is the number one cause of intellectual disability in United States, and if you think about that, I mean, that is a, that is a um, preventable cause of, of intellectual disability. Um, so there's an issue there. 
Then there's genetic and chromosomal conditions of which there are over 800 documented uh, chromosomal and genetic conditions that can cause intellectual disability. Um, Down syndrome being the most common, followed by fragile X syndrome. So these are very common chromosomal abnormalities that result in intellectual disability. And then there's infections during pregnancy that can also um, result in ID. Uh, some genetic disorders have inherent oral manifestations. And let's talk about Down syndrome because that's pretty much the, that's, that's the most common human malformation syndrome. I always tell my students that'll be on the test. You guys won't have a test, so don't worry about remembering that. But it's very common, right? We've all seen patients with Down syndrome. Many of us may have, have uh, family members or neighbors or friends uh, with Down syndrome, so very common. And here we see um, a typical class three. We see lots of malocclusion. Uh, we see the large tongue. Um, we also see some dehiscence there on the lower anteriors. Right, so we often see um, periodontal problems. We see uh, differences in the size and the shape of the teeth. We may see differences in the eruption patterns. So um, lots of oral manifestations. Um, so when we look at these three little cherubs, aren't they cute? That's Callie and Montana and Skye. They are the only known three siblings with Down syndrome. All three of them have Down syndrome and they have their own webpage and a blog and they're super cute. Their mom's always posting stuff about them. Um, but what do you notice when at uh, their faces? What do you notice about their, their posture, right? So very similar and it's not because they're um, siblings, it's because they all have the same syndrome, right? So what do we see? Um, short stature and obesity. Now it's common, but there are people who have Down syndrome that are not obese. I do have several patients who are workout fanatics. And uh, I really, I have a guy, he's, a, uh, he's in his 40s, he's a bodybuilder and he is a competitive bodybuilder. And he also, um, he lifts weights and he is a, um, he's, he's won the, um, a gold medal uh, in the US Special Olympics. And he has competed in, in the um, International Special Olympics and the Worldwide Special Olympics as a, as a bodybuilder. Uh, he's a, He's a power lifter actually. And um, he's short stature, but boy, he is not obese. He is in amazing shape. He's always working out. He goes to the gym like three or four hours a day. He was telling me during COVID, it was a nightmare because he couldn't go to the gym. And so he started finding things around his house that he could pick up. And uh, he started working out with um, tires and things like that. So pretty amazing. Um, mean IQ for patients with Down syndrome is about 50, but then again, if you look at that between 50 and 70, that's fairly high functioning. That's like sixth grade level of functioning. So, you know, these are folks who can, uh, you know, in general, will be able to speak with you and chat with you and, and understand uh, direction. Uh, congenital heart defects, a uh, big problem, right? We see it in about 40 to 50% of the population with Down syndrome. So important to uh, get the cardiac report from the cardiologist, get a good history, understand what kind of cardiac um, defect the patient might have had, whether it's been repaired, whether it's cyanotic. Um, that's going to help you decide whether the patient needs to be pre-medicated. And by that, I mean, if they fall under the American Heart Association guidelines uh, for patients that need to be pre-medicated because they have cyanotic um, um, congenital defects. So you have to know that. They have impaired immunity. So people with um, Down syndrome have a neutrophil defect and that accounts not only for their uh, increase in periodontal disease, but it also accounts um, for their increase in um, leukemia. So people um, have uh, quite a, a bit of impaired immunity and it can uh, be life-threatening. So important things to think about for patients with Down syndrome and taking your medical history. They have hypothyroidism that also, uh, right, that doesn't help their obesity. Uh, they have airway anomalies. Um, so if you're considering, oh, well, this patient might have to go to the operating room or we might have to sedate the patient, you have to consider that you really need to get a good look at the airway. Um, they also, uh, it's common to have what we call adlenoaxial instability, right, at the uh, atlas and the axis of the spine, uh, right below um, the head. Right? So this is really important. And the reason this is important is if you're going to um, intubate someone then, and you're going to lift their chin up and tilt their head back, 
uh, you need to have a cervical spine series of x-rays prior to doing that to make sure they don't have atlanoaxial instability. Um, because if you do a head tilt and chin lift on these folks, you know, it could um, really injure them, it could paralyze them. So um, another note to think, if you're going to rescue somebody, if you're going to rescue, do rescue breathing, um, and you're going to do um, CPR on someone with Down syndrome, you should always do a jaw thrust, right? So don't do head tilt chin lift, always a jaw thrust on these folks um, because you might save somebody's life and paralyze them. And I don't think you'd feel so good about that. So um, again, that's your tip for today if you're gonna be doing CPR on someone with Down syndrome. Um, other oral findings. So we see lots of maxillary hypoplasia. And the problem with that is that uh, it almost always impacts the uh, canines. So that's a problem because um, you have to really, and then, you know, we see patients and they come in in their 20s and now, or maybe sometimes even in their 30s and their canines are impacted and they have maxillary hypoplasia and there's really nowhere to go with the case. It's like, you can't even uncover the canines because there's nowhere to fit them in the arch. So these are folks that it's really important when you see kids with Down syndrome um, and they're young to really, really count the teeth. The first thing you should do on, on a six-year-old with Down syndrome is get a Panorex and count the teeth. Uh, do we have the right amount of teeth? Do we, are they shaped correctly? Um, or what kind of, uh, you know, space and do we have? And really looking at, are those canines going to get impacted? And if they are, should we do serial extractions to prevent the canines from being impacted? Particularly if you have a kid who is, you know, maybe a little ornery or got a little ants in the pants, moving around a lot, maybe not going to be the greatest uh, ortho patient, um, then you might really want to consider, oh, should we should you know, talk with your orthodontist and say, should we take those teeth out now? Should we do serial extraction so the canines come in? Because um, otherwise they may get impacted. And that's a really big take home point. Um, they often have missing or peg laterals. So if you have somebody who's missing or they have small laterals, then if the canines might come in then, right? So then you might have to do some, some prosthodontics in the front and take care of those, uh, making the canines that maybe look like laterals and things of that nature. Um, lots of periodontal disease, again, because of the neutrophil deficiency. Uh, so they tend to get periodontal disease because the attachment um, of, the, uh, of the periodontium is not good to the tooth. Um, the thing that's kind of amazing about that, though, is that you can see kids with, uh, or adults with Down syndrome, excuse me, who <clears throat> on x-ray have like no bone holding the teeth in. And yet, you know, the teeth are not really, really mobile. It's kind of amazing. And I always think, I always tell my students and they're being held in by like three really good Sharpies fibers. I don't really know why it happens, but I really, you see it much more often in patients with Down syndrome. And so many times I won't take those teeth out because if they're not gonna replace them and the patient's fine, the patient can tell me if they stop bothering them and there's no risk of aspiration. I'll, you know, the patient's functioning on them. Why would I take them out? The patient has adapted to that. Um, and we see lots of macroglossia, right? So we have patients with big tongues. And that's just one of my little, one of my many little cherubs. And I was taking pictures in the clinic and she wanted to take her picture. So I went ahead and did it. Here's an adult patient that we saw. And this is how he presented um, to the clinic. And you can see he is missing a lot of teeth. He's got uh, some primary teeth there. Um, he's got a huge diastema. Uh, he's got a very big tongue. <laughs> Um, and his mother wanted him to have teeth. And his mother was incredibly overbearing about this patient having teeth. And I wasn't so sure we should go ahead with this because the patient was like 30 and he was very shy. And I asked him like, do you think we should do this? Do you want us to have teeth? And he's like, my mom wants me to have teeth. Um, so that was his motivation. I, I didn't really think he wanted to have teeth, but his mother was clearly the boss and she was bossing him around and she told him he was getting teeth. And so he showed up to every single visit. Um, I didn't really want to do the case. I said, mm, you know, I don't like to do dentistry for parents. I like to do it for the patient. I like to improve the quality of my patient's lives. And I don't want to put them through something to make someone else happy. But his mother convinced one of our other uh, restorative dentists. And I said, yeah, go ahead. I want to see what was going to happen. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. And much to my surprise, once we finished the entire case, and you can see it down there on the bottom right, uh, he looked so good. 
and he had a newfound confidence and boy, he was an amazing guy and he's still a patient today and he doesn't let his mom come in the back. He told his mom, you know, mom, I'm a man. I, I can go to the dentist by myself. You can wait outside. Uh, so amazing. Um, even after all these years of doing this, I can be surprised as well. And he's super happy now. Uh, he has a good job and um, he uh, is popular with his friends and he's living, he's living a pretty good life. And, uh, and, his, and, and he's keeping his teeth clean. He's keeping his teeth clean. And um, his mom's really on him about that, but he's doing a great job. So let's see a little video about people with Down syndrome. So happy. Yeah. I'm my love over our team. Yeah. Hmm. What do you think? Are you guys excited for tomorrow? No, yeah. <laughs> you guys can figure out what's going on. Okay, well, are we eating outside? that video because you know it's like uh just shows you I, I like to show my students um you know people when they're just being people when they're not being when they're not being dental patients um so really nice video of people and just enjoying their life right um let's talk a little bit about neuromuscular disorders so cerebral palsy muscular dystrophy so this presents its own problems because these folks always have malocclusions and open bites uh often leading to constricted uh, upper arch um because they have hypotonia right so um and the muscles on the, on the outside of the mouth are pretty strong and then you have the muscles of the tongue um, and then folks will have uh, persistent drooling a medical term for that is sialuria so uh my students love that when i teach them that it's like well i love that you, know, you want to use a new word um so that is the medical term for drooling uh, and the patients often have airway compromise. And that's because, as you can see, uh, it would be pretty difficult to intubate uh, the patient on the left. I'm talking to the patient with a, a open bite and um, large tongue and tongue thrust. So, uh, you know, the, the uncontrolled muscular movements um, really make it difficult to treat patients uh, with CP. Um, so what is, is, what is CP? So it's a chronic disorder of movement and coordination, and it happens at or around the time of birth. Um, and it is damage to the motor uh, cortex in the developing brain. Now the damage itself, the encephalopathy doesn't change throughout life, right? So the lesion itself in the brain stays the same. Um, however, people may do a whole lot better or a whole lot worse, right? So with all sorts of uh, interventions. So with early intervention, with OT, with PT, uh, people can do a, a whole lot better. And many of our patients who we see early on as younger children that are using um, uh, crutches and uh, are able to ambulate by themselves later on. So uh, we see lots of improvement in actual functioning, but um, that has nothing to do with the actual encephalopathy, which stays the same throughout life. So here's one of our patients, and, and this is to show you the movement, is that even when we take a still photo, she's still moving. <laughs> she's always moving, so it makes it kind of difficult to work on. Um, so 40% of people with CP have intellectual disability. What does that mean? That most people who have cerebral palsy do not have an intellectual disability. So please, please, please do not treat people like they have an intellectual disability just because they have cerebral palsy. Also, please let people finish their sentences. We tend to want to guess what the patient might say. These patients often, it takes them time to complete a sentence. It may be difficult for them to understand. Um, and so if someone is speaking to you, resist the urge to complete the sentence or guess what they're going to say. Just let them finish the sentence. We have a young man who just finished, uh, when we first met him, he was in the master's degree. 
uh, program, a computer um, uh, science program at ASU, and today he has a PhD. Um, and he uses a motorized wheelchair, and he also has a, um, a, um, a, a soundboard, so he is actually able to uh, speak to us. So what he does is he punches in what he's going to say, and then it, it's a little voice, uh, much like Stephen Hawking had, right? So that is how he has an audio assistance device, and that's how he talks to us. So it takes him a while to reply because he's punching in uh, the letters, um, but he's fascinating and he's, he's, uh, he's a genius. He's actually really amazing. And he works um, at the, one of the computer labs um, at, a, at one of the ASU um, centers here in Arizona. And he is uh, working on projects that better the lives of people with um, disabilities. He's working on one right now with patients with ALS. So it tracks the eyes of where the patient's looking and that's how they are able to speak. So he's working on making that even better. So amazing kind of stuff. Um, let's meet a person with cerebral palsy now. Hello, Ted Women, what's up? Yeah. Not good enough. Hello, Ted Women, what is up? Yeah. My name is Maysoon Zayed, and I am not drunk, but the doctor who delivered me was. He caught my mom six different times in six different directions, suffocating poor little me in the process. As a result, I have cerebral palsy, which means I shake all the time. Look. It's exhausting. I'm like Shakira Shakira meets Muhammad Ali. <laughs> CP is not genetic. It's not a birth defect, you can't catch it. No one put a curse on my mother's uterus, and I didn't get it because my parents are first cousins, which they are. <laughs> it only happens from accidents, like what happened to me on my birthday. Now, I must warn you, I'm not inspirational. <laughs> and I don't want anyone in this room to feel bad for me because at some point in your life, you have dreamt of being disabled. Come on a journey with me. It's Christmas Eve. You're at the mall. You're driving around in circles looking for parking. And what do you see? 16 empty handicap spaces. And you're like, God, can I just be a little disabled? Also, I got to tell you, I got 99 problems and palsy is just one. <laughs> if, if there was an oppression Olympics, I would win the gold medal. I'm Palestinian, Muslim, I'm female, I'm disabled, and I live in New Jersey. <laughs> so that's uh, Maysoon Zayed. She is a professional actress and, uh, and comedian, and uh, she has not never let... Um, her disability get in her way. And you can see how much she moves and how much her face moves when she's talking. And so you can imagine that working, um, doing dentistry on patients with, with cerebral palsy is, is kind of a moving target. Um, but she's really funny. You should look her up and see some more of her. Uh, that, that TED Talk's particularly funny. Um, let's talk about patients with seizures disorders. So patients with seizure disorders. Uh, they often have gingival hyperplasia, right? And we see that as a result of, of medications, right? Um, so particularly Dilantin, other drugs that cause this, anti-rejection drugs, uh, things like Prograf, um, calcium channel blockers, drugs like nifedipine, some cyclosporin. So um, we can see this sort of gingival hyperplasia. We also see xerostomia because of medications. These folks are always, you know, on the, these anti-seizure meds. Now, the thing about gingival hyperplasia that's so interesting is that um, it turns out that it is genetic, and this was found um, uh, by a periodontist who did twin studies every year at the um, the twin cities. They have a big, uh, they have a, a very large um, kind of like state fair um, at Minneapolis St. Paul. There's a big big twin cities fair, and there's a convention for twins. Um, and so they did some studies on folks that were attending uh, the fair and this convention, and they took a look at 
uh, their genetics and whether or not they uh, had seizures and whether or not they had gingival hyperplasia. And it turns out that there's a gene for this. So if you have the ten, if you have that gene and we give you dilantin, your gingiva will overgrow. So what does that mean? That means that we need to change the drug, right? Because no matter what we do, you can't fight mother nature. You can't fight genetics, right? So no matter how great the patient's, you know, hygiene is, um, if you, you know, cut this gingiva away either with a laser or with a blade, it will come back as long as the patient's on the drug. Uh, so you have to think about other interventions. I often will ask neurologists to change from dilatin because dilatin is a really old drug and there are better drugs and uh, explain to them that this is genetic and that we can, you know, we can save the patient from having to go through a procedure, you know, every year or so in trying to get this gingiva under control. Uh, I just saw a patient last week and the student said to me, I don't know why his gums look like this. And, uh, you know, we want him to, to change his calcium channel blocker. And I'm like, well, that's great. We can get him off the calcium channel blocker, but the patient had a kidney transplant and he's on ProGraph and we can't change that. <laughs> so I said, uh, I don't think it's the nifedipine. It could be, but that doesn't even matter because the patient's gonna be on ProGraph for the rest of his life. So we have to come up with a better strategy and talk to the patient about excellent home care and coming in more often. And, um, you know, for this, for this patient, uh, we're going to end up probably just having to laser off his his uh, hypertrophic uh, hypertrophic uh, gingiva every couple months. Uh, there isn't really a better tool right now for transplant patients. Um, so what is the seizure? So um, there's always electrical discharges in the brain, um, but these cause alterations in the behavior and in consciousness. So neuron interactions in your brain, uh, they're pretty chaotic, but it's balanced. And there's, even if there's a few disruptions, nothing will happen on the outside. But when we have multiple cells misfire at the same time, when there's like, when all the neurons are firing, uh, depending on the severity and in the location, you will see muscle spasms or twitches and that we look at and we call a seizure. Um, what's the difference between epilepsy and a seizure? A seizure is a single occurrence. It happens one time. It's an event. Epilepsy is when you have two or more uh, unprovoked seizures. So um, when we look at patients who they say have epilepsy, that means they've had more than one seizure. Uh, you could have a seizure. You could have a seizure from a trauma. You might, uh, we see febrile seizures in small children. We see seizures sometimes in older adults. Um, if you see a seizure in a patient who does not have a, you know, a medical history of epilepsy, uh, that's a problem, especially if it's like a working age person. That is a very dangerous sign and you need to immediately call 911. And during this, this uh, series, we're going to talk about patients who have seizures in another webinar. If you're really interested, uh, we're going to go much more in depth into this topic. But a thing to remember, I think a good takeaway is that a seizure in a patient who is not diagnosed with epilepsy and is of working age is a very dangerous thing and you should call 911 immediately. Don't wait for three or five minutes, just call right away um, because those tend to be caused by um, really bad things, things like tumors. Um, and so we, we don't wanna see that, okay? Those are folks, uh, aneurysms, things like that. So we really don't want to be seeing that. Um, it can be very dangerous. Um, generalized seizures begin everywhere at once and partial seizures begin in one part of the brain and they spread across the brain uh, through the neurons. Autism, everybody always asks me, I know people love to talk about autism. Um, and they always say like, if you wanted to know uh, what causes autism, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't know. I know a lot of lists, I have a list of things that I know don't cause it or have been proven not to cause it, um, but it's a very interesting an evolving field in research. And again, there will be a whole webinar devoted just to talking about autism. Uh, what is it? What isn't it? What causes it? What doesn't cause it? And how do you work with folks with autism in your practice? Um, what autism is, it's pervasive DD. Um, and there are excesses and deficits in behavior. It's a lifelong disability right now. We cannot cure autism. Uh, again, we teach social skills. We do applied behavioral analysis. We teach people how to cope better, um, but we cannot cure it. It is extremely complex. And if you meet one person with autism, you met one person with autism because they're all different, just like us. Uh, so it's a spectrum disorder. So 
This is refers to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, right? So put out by the American Psychological Association. Um, and it's social and communication and then repetitive behavior and play. So people communicate differently. They respond differently socially. Um, they play differently and they may have you know, a lot of repetitive behaviors. So let's meet someone with autism. I think I'll start out and just talk a little bit about what exactly autism is. Autism is a very big continuum that goes from very severe, the child remains nonverbal, all the way up to brilliant scientists and engineers. And I actually feel at home here because there's a lot of autism genetics here. You wouldn't have any... Um, It's a continuum of traits. When does a nerd turn into, you know, uh, Asperger, which is just mild autism? I mean, Einstein and Mozart and Tesla would all be probably diagnosed as uh, autistic spectrum today. And one of the things that really is going to concern me is getting these kids to, to be the ones that are going to invent the next energy things, you know, that Bill Gates talked about this morning. Okay. Now, if you want to understand autism animals, and I want to talk to you about different ways of thinking, you have to get away from verbal language. I think in pictures. I don't think in language. Now, the thing about the autistic mind is it attends to details, okay? This is a test where you either have to pick out the big letters or pick out the little letters, and the autistic mind picks out the little letters more quickly. And the thing is, the normal brain ignores the details. Well, if you're building a bridge, details are pretty important because it'll fall down if you ignore the details. And one of my big concerns with a lot of policy things today is things are getting too abstract. People are getting away from doing hands-on stuff. I'm really concerned that a lot of the schools have taken out the hands-on classes because art and classes like that, those were the classes where I excelled. So that is Temple Grandin. She's a lady with multiple PhDs. Uh, she works in animal, um, uh, I would say humane animal practices. So she has developed many things um, in order to slaughter animals more humanely. Um, she has a unique perspective as someone with autism. And you can see she's kind of talking, it's very interesting. She's talking about this group in, in California and she's saying, you know, that there's a lot of autism genetics in the audience and you notice that people laugh, but she doesn't laugh. She doesn't think it's funny. She's just telling you a fact, right? She's like, well, yeah. So uh, here in, you know, maybe in Silicon Valley, we see lots of, of people with autism. We see lots of famous people uh, who have been diagnosed or not diagnosed, but people who come out with uh, and don't think linearly like we do. They think in pictures, they have big, they can really see the big picture. They can see amazing things. So like she talked about Einstein and Mos, uh, Mozart and, and Tesla, all famous people who really um, thought differently than other people were able to move humanity forward in amazing ways. Um, and the interesting thing about Temple Grandin is she always wears the same outfit. Like not the same exact outfit, but it's like her uniform. She wears her bolero and, and her Western uh, shirt and jeans, like no matter where she's going. It's pretty amazing. I've never seen her any pictures of her or seen her live wearing anything else. So that's her kind of comfort and safety zone makes her feel good. Um, you can read uh, her book. It's called Thinking in Pictures. Uh, she has a couple books, but that's a particularly good book. Um, it's an HBO movie called Temple Grandin. And um, it's, it's really good. It's starring Claire Danes. It's really, really good and give you a good insight into how people with autism react. Um, so there are other challenges for people with um, DD. So long-term medication regimens, um, lots of sugar in those uh, liquid medications. There's a ton of sugar um, in, you know, in all sorts of uh, any kind of liquid medication. Um, they get reduced salivary flow because of psychotropic and anti-seizure medications. And we already talked about dilantin with calcium channel blockers and uh, anti-rejection drugs. Uh, increased risk of trauma. So if you don't ambulate well, if you have seizures, um, you know, we see patients who come in and are missing, you know, teeth and they have the first seizure and they met and they break eight and nine and then you make them a bridge and then they break that bridge and now you extend the bridge and it's like, okay, what are we going to do here? This becomes a really, really big problem. 
Um, interestingly, I've read some articles and actually met a guy in Scotland who does um, implants for patients with um, who have seizures and patients with CP who have uh, lost their front teeth. And what he'll do is he'll actually cut through the abutment at about 45 degrees um, and almost all the way through the abutment so that if the patient falls, he can, he can take it out and, and replace it. So very interesting um, sort of, of out of the box idea about how we replace um, teeth for folks uh, with dental trauma in this group. We see lots of oral habits. We see tons and tons of bruxism working on a case right now with our residents, a young man in his late twenties and um, his teeth look very much like the picture of bruxism here. You can actually see the pulp horns and we are working very hard to try and figure out some ways that we can get him um, to stop bruxing. Um, and that includes a night guard. It includes him having some myofacial therapy and it also includes him having Botox injections to stop uh, his bruxism. Um, we see patients with self-injurious behaviors. This is actually a patient I treated. Uh, you can see she bit through her lip. She also avulsed a permanent tooth on herself. Um, and, you know, self-injurious behaviors, let me just say a word to the wise. You can't fix this as a dentist. The patient is trying to tell us something. The patient is suffering and cannot, you know, most of the times this happens in patients who are nonverbal. It's more common in patients who have sensory deficits. So if patients are, are blind or deaf, it's more common. Um, and the problem is that we think, oh, well, we'll just make her a dental appliance. And you can see here, I put some composite over her lower teeth and I thought, oh, well, that'll stop it. Um, but it didn't, um, she, kept, she kept doing it. Um, we, I went to a conference where there was some very smart developmental pediatricians and they talked about self-injurious behaviors and that the first thing you should do is when you rule out that it's a dental situation, which we had, um, then you should send the patient for a medical exam. And the most common reasons that people engage in this are, are twofold. Number one, aspiration pneumonia, and number two, GERD. So if you think about that, um, if I'm trying to get your attention and I don't, you know, if you're trying, if you keep feeding me and I have GERD, I'm not gonna be very happy. If I can't breathe and I can't tell anyone because I have pneumonia, I'm gonna be very unhappy. So these are folks who are trying to tell us something. You need a, someone to do behavioral interventions. Um, this young lady did well with um, applied behavioral analysis and actually took about three weeks and we were able to get her, with the help of the therapist to get her to stop doing this. So it's not something you can handle on your own. Um, you do need a team for this. Um, you need behavioral pediatricians. You're going to need um, um, behavioral therapists for this kind of stuff. Um, and you're going to be needing to work in a team. Uh, patients have physical limitations. I love these slides. They're so groovy. They're from the ADA from the 70s. Uh, and I scanned them. Um, they were like, uh, I don't know. So you see the nice orange Naga hide. And really the point of this is that um, make an adaptive hygiene device. We've all seen uh, toothbrushes put into um, uh, um, in, into tennis balls and anything that your patient can grip. Um, lots of things on the market. You can always adapt something. And you know, think outside the box. We don't have to brush and floss in the bathroom. The bathroom is a dangerous place. It's filled with hard floors, uh, sinks, right? So there's metal in there and there's porcelain and there's tubs and it's a really dangerous place, particularly when it's wet. So, you know, why do we have to do that? If we don't have somebody who has a good gait or we have somebody who has seizures, like why can't we brush our teeth in the living room? Why can't we brush our te teeth in the kitchen chair? There's no reason that someone has to go in the bathroom, okay? Um, you can have the patient lay down on the floor. Um, needs pe the patient's mouth open. So these are some of the, of the things that we do for patients when we're brushing or we're doing an exam. Um, we will use uh, a, the rubber or silicone bite blocks. I don't recommend that you ever use a malt mouth prop um, unless you've been trained to do it. They're dangerous. They can snap closed. They often um, get the patient's facial, their skin and facial hair caught in them. So I would not use that at all unless you've really been trained with it. Um, the open wide mouth block is uh, commercially available. You can Google it. Um, and what you do is you just, it's got a handle, it's got a short side and a long side. You put it on the flat side, when the patient opens up, you flip it open and then you can rinse it off. You can write on it with a Sharpie and uh, it can air dry and the, and the patient and the caregiver can use it for quite a long time. 
So the patient comes to your office. We've got a patient come in with IDDD. Where are we going to start? So before the patient even gets there, we like to send home a nice welcome packet, okay? And we want to know things like, and our, our staff is trained obviously to do this, um, who is going to give consent? Uh, if it's a child, obviously, usually that's a parent. Um, but what if the patient's an adult, somebody over 18? Who is the legal guardian? Who can give consent? Does someone have a uh, medical power of attorney? Then we always go, we have a thorough medical history. We want to know the patient's medications, you know, regular medical history. We always ask if the patient has a primary care physician. Many of our patients also have specialists. So you can imagine that uh, somebody, you know, we have neurologists and nephrologists. We have pretty much every ologist, cardiologist. So if there are other specialists based on uh, uh, what patients tell us, we, we, we may want to contact them as well. We also want to know how did dentistry get done in the past? Has the patient had sedation or general anesthesia for procedures? And we always ask who does the oral hygiene at home? Does mom or dad, is it a caregiver? Does the patient do it themselves? Is it assisted? Is it supervised? And assisted means maybe hand over hand or mom or dad or the caregiver is actually holding the patient's hand and, and doing it. Um, or supervised where, you know, the patient, we ask the patient to go in the bathroom and we stand in the doorway. Supervised does not mean send the patient in the bathroom and then later go check to see if the toothbrush is wet because they've already figured that out, okay? We've had patients um, and they just go in and they wet the toothbrush and they run the, the uh, they'll, they'll run the, the water and then they come out and they're like, I'm all done. It's like, great trick, but you can only do it once with us. We'll check on that. We'll look at your plaque index. Uh, what about patients? Uh, do they have a physical disability? Will they need ADA requirements, space? What about transferring patients if they're in a wheelchair? Um, adaptive aids. Uh, what about hearing and vision? Do they have sensory impairments? Um, so I like this little cartoon because it really is, I don't know, it's just funny, right? Um, we take a behavioral history. Those are also available um, online. You can Google behavioral history for children with special needs uh, or adults. We always ask about how does the patient make their needs known? How do they communicate to you? How do you know if the patient's in pain? How do you know if they need anything? How do you know if the patient's hungry? Um, we ask about reactions to stimuli such as noise or touch or light. Um, most of us will have, um, we have fluorescent lighting in our offices. Fluorescent lighting is actually flickering. You can't see it. People with autism actually can. Many will tell us like, I can't stand that light. It's, uh, it's flickering and it's driving me nuts. Um, so it's nice to put those little lights, uh, light covers over your fluorescent lighting. Uh, things like little clouds or stuff like that. It's pretty nice to look up at rather than looking at those fluorescent lights. Um, most patients with, um, with autism, many of them will have stereotypic behaviors. They like to do the same thing. They want to sit in the same place. They like to do the same thing. They might watch the same movie over and over again. They might obsess about one particular topic um, and they like sameness, okay? Um, we always ask about previous dental experiences. Have they had any outstanding, like really positive experiences or horribly negative experiences? And do they have any triggers? Is there anything that really sets the patient off and then the behavior starts going downhill? Um, what about favorite things that they like, right? Is there things that they like um, to distract? We have patients who bring in everything. We have a patient who's like totally obsessed with the Lion King and she brings in her her uh, Simba and she has a Nala and they're stuffed animals and she likes to bring those in and that's fine, we, we, you know, great. Um, we have another patient who has like a spinning toy that he really likes and he spins the toy one way and then he stops and he spins it the other way. Um, and that's a great distraction for him. Um, what time of day does the patient do well at? You know, um, not everybody is, is a morning person. Some people do better in the afternoon and vice versa. And what about attention span? How much time are we gonna have to actually get this done? Uh, if you know nothing about American Sign Language, please learn this. this. This, when you shake it, is the symbol for bathroom. Almost every patient I have ever met who's nonverbal knows this sign. <laughs> so making your needs known. Raise your hand if it hurts, and if you have to go to the bathroom, give me the sign. Uh, otherwise, you might end up, uh, you know, having some uh, difficult times if people uh, urinate and et cetera. So learn the bathroom sign. First visit, again, comprehensive exam. Be ready, get your room ready, have everything up. Are you planning on taking radiographs? Do you have all your radiographs set up? Do you have, uh, are you in a room with, um, uh, with, with radiographs? Uh, are you planning on getting a panel? What kind of, if the patient's in a wheelchair, will you be able to use the panel? 
Um, make sure you have everything you could possibly need in that room. You don't want to have to leave. And what about your environment? Um, it turns out that everybody does better in a cool, chill environment. So lots of times we turn our, our lights off and we have uh, music, whatever the patient likes on, and uh, we just use our headlamps. Uh, there's some studies on this and kids with special needs. It turns out everyone does better with a more chill environment. Uh, distractions and rewards. So what is the patient like? Uh, listening to music, uh, playing a portable video machine. I don't really care what it is. As long as the patient's distracted and happy, I am happy. And uh, sometimes we say we're going to do a reward. So we say to the patient, uh, we're going to count to 10 and brush your teeth. And, and then you're going to get your video game back for one minute. Things like that. Um, treatment planning. So start at ideal, then consider the patient's abilities, wants, and needs. Okay. Can the patient uh, maintain this? They might be able to tolerate it, but can they maintain it? So you start at ideal and then you adapt and you modify based on the patient's abilities, wants, and needs. You got to think about the whole person. Can the patient maintain it? Can they sit? Will they wear a removable prosthetic? Well, sometimes I look at the patient and I ask mom like, uh, do they ever wear glasses? Will they wear a hearing aid? Things like that. Um, uh, are aesthetics an issue for the patient or the family? And who benefits? I always want to say to patients, to parents, like, you really think that will benefit the patient? Will the patient be happier? I can do dentistry on anybody. I can figure out a way to do it. But will the patient be happy? And will it improve your son or daughter's quality of life? Okay. And then what about the patient's medical status? Again, we see food used as a frequent reward. We like to change that and make it a non-food kind of thing because many patients are being rewarded with sweets. Um, what about getting our daily hygiene done? You can't give up. I mean, would you give up if the kid didn't want to take a bath, right? You can't, you just can't give up on that. And we have to create good strategies for that. And then we think about difficult or disruptive behavior. And as long as the patient isn't doing something that's going to hurt me, I just let them do their behavior. I don't pay it any mind because then they're trying to get out of it. It's an avoidance mechanism, right? Um, tell, show, do, modeling, ABA. You can look that up. That's a really involved, um, uh, something that you do with therapists. And that is in the autism lecture, um, medical immobilization, if you have to stabilize someone, and then sedation and anesthesia. Tell, show, do should always be appropriate. Don't talk to people who are 30 like they're five, even if they're mentally like five. It's really disrespectful. Always talk to the patient not to the caregiver, talk to the patient. The caregiver can hear you. Uh, give the patient that dignity and that respect. Um, I give patients like plastic mirrors and I let them hold them. I put gloves on the patient if they want. I give them the plastic mirror to take home. I give them a mouth prop to take home, the gloves and the mask. Patients should never leave your office with a toothbrush that hasn't been used on them, right? I always want to, they never get a goodie bag that hasn't been opened. I want to see how we're brushing. How's mom brushing? How's the patient brushing? Um, we can use positive reinforcement. Um, so we do things like we have patients come for social visits. They can come and they can just call us and say, come in for a social visit. And they will come and walk around the clinic and one of our assistants will take them and they'll let them sit in the chair and take them up and down in the chair and practice. Um, never use negative reinforcement. No one likes to be yelled at. It is not, you will never get where you want to go with yelling at people. Um, and Every time the patient does what they're supposed to do, I say, good job, patient opens their chair. Oh, that's awesome, you're doing great. They sit, they allow an exam. Oh, let me count to five, let me count five teeth. They do great, I'm very happy. Um, I never use negative reinforcement unless the patient is gonna do something dangerous. And then I will raise my voice and make sure they, that startles them enough to stop, okay? Um, but yelling at people never works. Um, Again, calm music and pleasant scenery, but some people like rap. So whatever the patient likes, I will put on for them. It's their visit, it's their time, whatever music they like, whatever video they wanna watch, okay with me. So let's watch as we work on this young lady. Do you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Younger or older? Eleni. Younger. All right, wait. Are your brother and sister older or younger than you? Older. <laughs> I'm smaller, I'm bigger. That's true, you are smaller. Yeah. So here's a young lady with autism. And you notice that she is has to be prompted by her mom. She's not answering the questions. And she's totally absorbed with her phone. And she doesn't really interact with anybody. So let's see what happens next. 
Watch what happens when oh. they take the phone away. She completely melts down. Sweetheart, I'm gonna have you take your glasses off, okay? Because Thank she's you. never been to our clinic before. Um, this is a first visit. Thanks and for coming in and see how anxious yeah, she, she gets when so she's moving around. Mm -hmm. She's really, really trying to manage her behavior. All right, Lenny, you ready to hop out yeah. and come take some pictures? Oh, are you doing all right? So you can see there um, that she's really struggling um, because she was so focused on that. So I think the mistake there is I would not have taken that away from her until I was really ready to do anything. And then if I needed her attention, I would still let her hold the phone and I would continue. I also would never say, we're going to take x-rays. Okay. I never make it a question. It's always a command form. We're taking x-rays now. We're... I need you to open your mouth. It's direct, it's, it's very direct, and I need you to do this or this or this right now. Um, because what if the patient says no? Like, no, I don't wanna take x-rays. What are you gonna do, right? So remember that when we're working with patients that you know to be empathetic and understanding um, and try to have fun, try to have fun. Um, again, everybody's different. People with disabilities are very different from other other people and we want to be kind and gentle and try everything we can. Remember that people with families with, with kids with special needs have high levels of parenting stress. They're at risk for other psychological and social disturbances and financial strain. These folks are having a tough time. So in summary, we tell you that there are four types of developmental disabilities. Uh, people with developmental disabilities have unique care barriers when accessing dental care. And that treatment plans, you know, start at the beginning at the, you know, the Cadillac of treatment plans, but they have to be modified or adapted so that they work for a patient. Okay. Um, we always use people first language. We always say a person with, we never use the R word. That's why it's in red. We say a person with intellectual disability, a person with epilepsy. Okay. Very important very important. And all of the things that we talked about today in each of the following seminars, we're going to talk about really um, each individual kind of, um, we're going to talk about individual, uh, um, the big four. So one on CP, one on autism, one on uh, um, uh, neuromuscular, and <clears throat> we're going to talk about that. So there will be much more um, on dealing with patients with autism. There's going to be a whole session on that, and those will be much more definitive. This was kind of the thousand foot view. So our next session you see right here um, is Thursday, uh, January 21st. You can register at that link. It's going to be, we're going to talk about patients with cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular disorders, or as I try to think of it as doing dentistry on a moving target. How do we make that happen? Um, so I think Tracy, you are there. I don't know if we have um, any questions. I'm going to stop my share. Well, I'll leave it up since I'll I leave it up. One question. Um, okay. What are the dental concerns for patients who have a gastro gastro tube and are exclusively tube fed? Oh, so for patients with G-tubes, yeah, we're going to talk about the with neuromuscular, but patients with G-tubes, um, so you never, I, I don't usually use a Cavitron. I hand scale those patients. If you're going to use a Cavitron, you just have to make sure you have, get, seat the patient up and make sure that somebody is suctioning. Um, you want to get the, the calculus off of the gingiva, okay? It's not so important to get it off the, don't, don't worry about getting it off the occlusal surfaces. You want to get that popcorn calculus off of the gingiva. The patient is not at risk for caries because the patient doesn't eat, right? So remember that Venn diagram, if there's no fermentable carbohydrates, the patient will not get caries, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. If they regurgitate, you can sometimes get caries and that's why we don't take the calculus off of the occlusal, okay? So, so the thing is you wanna get the calculus off of the gingiva. And we'll talk about that in, uh, when we talk about neuromuscular disorders. Great. It seems that that is our only question. Uh, we had a lot of positive feedback. People loved your videos and they loved your stories and they really, really enjoy the presentation. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Perry, for your presentation and thank you everyone for attending the webinar. You will receive a link to view the recording of today's presentation in the coming week via email. 
Um, and for those who did opt for CE during registration, you will receive CE credit for this course. I misspoke earlier. Um, you have the option during registration. So if you did choose to, to um, get CE, you will get CE. Uh, so on behalf of Henry Shine and everyone, thank you for attending and have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.